Hi, welcome to WebPixel Live. My name is Adam, ha Adam Hanlon. I'm the editor of WebPixel, and I'd like to thank Naughty Cam for sponsoring this episode. Naughty Cam make a range of, of housings for almost every um, camera around, and also some fantastic uh, water contact optics. So please check, head on over to their website to check out what they're up to. Um, while we're on the subject of introductions and thanks, I'd like to welcome Alex Mustard to, to our conversation today. Hi, Alex. Morning, Adam. Good to see you. Morning. Yeah, good to see you too. Um, so um, I thought we could pick on Alex here a little bit because Alex is fascinated by shipwrecks. Um, I know this having known him for quite a long time. So, um, And I thought I'd ask him to try and explain why he's fascinated by shipwrecks. Um, so there you go, Alex. That's um, that's a, I ask you some difficult questions. I know this is going to be probably may top, maybe top them all. Well, it, it's actually something that developed, you know, not immediately with me as an underwater photographer. Hmm. I think when I, I started out in in underwater photography, I was fascinated with marine life, obviously having a marine biology background. Um, and I was used to just treat any wreck dive as a chance to shoot more marine life and, hmm. and not I was never interested in the wrecks themselves. Hmm. But I think particularly regularly diving in the northern Egyptian Red Sea, I think where there are a number of really spectacular re um, wrecks, I think that really converted me to the photographic possibilities of shipwrecks. Yeah. And as I you know, often think, you know, shipwrecks, they don't move, but it doesn't make them easy to photograph well. Um, and I think that's part of the, the allure of it, is that you, you know that the picture should be kept possible, but you can't always get exactly what you want. And I think that just pulls you back in. I'd also say that I think shipwreck photography is a very diverse realm of underwater photography. And I think it challenges you to produce a whole variety of pictures, pictures with people in, pictures without people in, um, pictures over uh, with using lots of different lenses, pictures using lots of different lighting styles. Mm. And when we started Underwater Photography of the Year competition, I, you know, was very keen to always have a rep photography category in it, simply to, you know, because I think underwater photography is much more than just natural history photography. It, it is, you know, it is people photography and it is rep photography. And I think that's really important. Yep. And I have to say that that's been incredibly well rewarded because I think the rec photography category of UPY has probably some of the most innovative photography of any of the categories, yep. um, particularly because I think there's been incredible advancements in there. Um, one in photogrammetry of people using that as a technique for mapping wrecks, and we, we've covered that on Wet Pixel Live before. But also I think that divers are now not just going down to photograph wrecks, they're going down to light wrecks. Yep. And as a result, the, the progress and the innovation and the, the talent and skill of wreck photographers, I think is some of the highest in underwater photography. I think, you know, perhaps kind of black water and super macro photography, I was like, wow, you're so good. But actually, <laughs> I think it's actually some of the, the deep wreck photographers or the very creative wreck photographers that for me are really pushing the boundaries of underwater photography back the most. So I think it's a fantastic thing to um, area of underwater photography and one that uh, some people don't appreciate enough. But I think we should run through sort of how to shoot wrecks as well. Yeah, sure. I think I, just before the photographers whose wreck photography I love, and there's lots I do, and it does feel a bit unfair to pick out just one, is um, Tobias Friedrich, um, who's had regular success winning the wreck category in UPY. Yeah. And I was going to read out a quote from from his book about wreck photography. Yeah. And there's a, I think that, you know, the first thing that he says, is, you know, is is that actually not every wreck is going to be great for photography. It's um, true. Yeah. And you know, he says seek out the the more photogenic ones. Um, wrecks that are standing upright in good conditions are ideal candidates. Um, for producing fascinating pictures. The more destroyed a wreck is, the harder it will be for you to depict it as a sunken relic. Yep. Um, so, you know, going to places where wrecks are in good condition, I think it is really important to, because actually what the audience wants is they want that graphic representation of something that really does look like a ship. Yep. You know, load a pile, a pile of metal it's might not. be historically important but it's not going to reach out and connect with the okay, audience okay. so my first advice always when teaching rep photography is the big shot the big recognizable shot of superstructure of bows of sterns of guns of the bridge big shots of that are always the shots that are going to appeal to the the, uh, the audience um i often go um, reference i think it's referenced in my book um the the cover of um tintin's red rackham's treasure where there's them, uh, Tintin's driving around in a shark submarine, and behind there's like a sunken galleon. 
Yeah. It just looks like a wooden galleon with the sails still up and everything. Yeah, yeah. But I think that that image of a shipwreck is actually what a lot of the public have. Yeah. And whenever we can capture a ship looking like a ship but clearly underwater, yeah. I think we then have a very powerful wreck picture. And that typically happens with the big shots. I'm, I'm going to backtrack um, a little bit, Alex, just to, just yeah, to sure. stop you in full flow. Sorry, but I, I remember back in the, it must have been the early 90s, um, diving with with Lee Bishop and some other people who at that stage were kind of uh, at the cutting edge of, of sort of trimix deep wreck diving um, and early days rebreathers really. Um, and and I, I wasn't at that stage, I certainly, I wasn't all soft, but I wasn't taking pictures of, on those types of dives. Um, and um, I remember watching Lee getting his tripod out at 80 meters or something and taking pictures it was on film, actually, as, as far as I remember, um, of this wreck. And I remember thinking at the time, I remember thinking, you know, this is such a technical discipline. Um, you know, the, the, you know, when we're shooting reefs at the end of the day, we float around a reef, neutrally buoyant, lots of light. You know, this is a situation where people are getting these tools out that, that are really quite technical photographic tools to, to in order to try and capture them. And this was in UK conditions, so relatively you know, light, all the rest, um, and, and using lights, divers lights to light things up and stuff. So I remember thinking at the time, you know, this is really where the technolo technological edge of diving in some places of, of, of underwater photography is really happening. Um, and I still feel that I think a lot of the, a lot of the stuff that we're doing and okay, of course it applies in other areas of something, but a lot of the stuff that's being done at Rex really is, is very much the cutting edge in terms of, in terms of technical um, abilities. Um, and, and equally, just to reinforce what you say, you know, the wreck that looks like it, it's sitting on, should have been sitting on the surface and sitting on the bottom bolt upright with, with its sails up. Um, and, you know, that's the one that people are going to go, look at that. that. That's how people expect wrecks to be. And there's this, there's this expectation, as you say, a pile of debris isn't really going to fire their imagination in the same way. Um, yeah, I think that's why, you know, particularly the, those classic um, Egyptian Red Sea wrecks are so popular because there's so many fully intact or, or at least big sections of them intact yep. very photogenically sized wrecks in a relatively small area yeah, yeah. Um, and, and and also you know another, i mean there's lots in lots of places in the world but i think that's why that area really fired my imagination up and because i was diving a lot in that area it got me into this type of photography yep, yep. i think if you're going for those big shots you need to be realistic about technique and suitable technique and one of the early realizations you have as a photographer is that you're unlikely to be able to shoot something that big and light it up with the strobes on your camera. And you're most often best to turn those strobes off because all they're going to do is light up all the particles in the water between you and the wreck yep. and not really have any effect on the wreck. Yep. And most of the time, these wrecks aren't exactly bright pink and really worth lighting up anyway. They're, they're typically you know, more boring colors. So those shots work best as available light shots, yep. either as black and white available light shots as sort of monochromatic blue available light shots or as white balance shots, particularly shot with filter where you can bring out the color of the wreck and, and hold the nice color of the water at the same time. So you've kind of got three options for, the, for those kind of big scenic shots. Yeah. Um, I, uh, when I start going inside a wreck though, cause sometimes the inside of a wreck is where the real story is. That's perhaps when, when, the, when, when things start to change a little bit and I'll definitely want to start adding flash guns yeah. um, for my photography. I think one of the other challenges of rec photography is choosing which lens to use. Yeah, because for those big shots, you absolutely want the widest lens possible because the bigger your lens, the more you're going to get in. And a fisheye works very well for that. The downside of a fisheye can be the distortion of it. But because a lot of parts of wrecks are quite bendy anyway, you know, curved bows, cur you know, curved sterns, that sort of thing, you'd be amazed how many wrecks actually almost look better in a fisheye shot. And one of the classic Red Sea wrecks is the, is the Janus D. It's a cargo ship um, sunk on Abu Nuhas Reef. Mm. And the stern of that ship not only is perfectly sized for a fisheye shot, actually it looks much nicer made curvy with a slightly curvy with fisheye distortion than it does if you shoot it with a rectilinear lens. Yeah. Um, but that, you know, that's just a, a I, 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 However, I, when we start going inside the wrecks, I think that that curvature sometimes. of the lens can become less of a desirable feature yeah my, um, my my brain definitely doesn't like curved lines where there aren't meant to be one so so i think i think you're absolutely right Alex. i think there are some parts of the wreck that i i certainly fish is fine but where you've got things like lines or rails when there's that that very um 
distinctive sort of fisheye curve in it. Mm. My brain that 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 my brain automatically gets attracted to that rather than the rest of the image. Um, so I, yeah, I think my, you have to I choose my, your spot. My kind of rule is, is what looks right is, is best. Yeah, yeah. And the good thing about shipwrecks is yes, they have lots of straight lines on them. Yep. But they also have lots of nice natural curves they do. Yep. that give them good shape and graphic areas, you know, particularly yep. bows and sterns and, and, yep. and sections of the ship. Yep. And so they can actually, big sections of them can look even better almost with the fish eye. And the fact that you can get closer and get more in improves the, the image quality Absolutely. because of the, the wide view of the fish eye. Yep. When you go inside, though, I definitely begin to agree that the rectilinear lens rises much more to the top of your wish list um, because once you're inside the wreck, then straight lines are really important. Yeah. Um, what a lot of photographers find they're doing is if they do decide to do a wreck dive and um, they are on fisheye, they may look at de-fishing in the software, some of their internal shots, because it's one of the few times that I would ever click that correct the lens button, because yeah. inside the wreck it can be, you know, that, that bendiness this picture can look better without it. Yeah. If you are, um, well, I won't I'll, I'll get too much into that. So I would say, yeah, if, if your target of the wreck is the inside, it's probably wiser to go rectilinear. If your target is more the outside, then I would go fisheye. And actually, there's another quote in Tobias's book that I think really speaks to that, in that it's saying, you know, it's worth spending an entire day on a wreck to explore its photographic potential. Yeah. And, I, you know, I've, I've paraphrased a bit there, but it's, um, you know, I think that, you know, good wreck photography doesn't happen easy. These wrecks, yes, they're staying still, but it can take several dives, even several dives over several years to really get a definitive take on the wreck because of the desire to use different lenses, different techniques, techniques inside yeah. and out. Yeah. The outside of the wreck, you can't move the wreck, so you have to wait for the sun to move around it. So if you want certain elements of it lit up, you need to dive it at specific times of the day when the sun is in the right place for it. Yep. And you know, on, on the workshops I run, we're very precise on when we dive the wrecks for certain photographs yep. because of where the sun is going to be in um, relative to the wreck. And, uh, um, it, come Oh, so I was going to cover a couple of other techniques. So, so I mean, obviously, the thing I was going to give an example of that, if you're in the holds of the of the boat, you really want the sun overhead, so you've got the light coming down through the hold, typically you want the sun. So that's an exam, practical example of, you know, you're going to time, you might do external shots in the morning when the sun's at an angle, and then wait until midday um, in order to do the, the inside internal shots, for example. Sorry, yeah, right. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, you know, um, it's, you know, all the wrecks point a certain direction. It's the sun rises in the east, sets in the west, if, you're, if the bow of your wreck points towards the west, then you're probably going to want to dive that wreck in the afternoon when there's more light round on the on the on the stern on yeah. the bow. I mean, yeah. you know, it's uh, you know, it's, it don't, you don't need to do loads of calculations. However, it can be quite. You often don't know until you've dived the wreck exactly what direction it's facing. Yeah. Um, which is why that whole you know spending time and planning is important. Um, a couple of other techniques I wanted to mention. The first is the use of off-camera lighting, yep. either as off-camera strobes or as big off-camera video lights. Yep. I think that's a very, very valuable technique in wreck photography. These can either be placed on tripods within the internals of the wreck to create depth in dark places to light things up, um, and they can be very effective. Or alternatively, they can be held by a dive buddy or even several dive buddies to light up large sections of the wreck. Yep. Um, with some of the big video lights or, or even just a big diver's torch, I think one of the classic really nice deeper wreck dive shots is where you shoot the wreck and you have the diver hovering nearby and their beam of light is kind of a bit like a lightsaber going across to the wreck and then you have a, a pool of illumination from their torch. Yep. Um, and that's quite easy to do on a deeper, darker wreck and quite hard to do on a bright, shallow Red Sea wreck. Yep. Um, but it's, I think that's a really nice type of, of shot to do. And then um, a final technique, which I think is underused, but really, really powerful on shipwrecks, is panoramas. So not, not the whole photogrammetry that we started off talking about, but just where, because of the tight space that you're in, the fact that you've got, kind of, you've got to try to photograph a room from inside it, yep. making panoramas of insides of the wreck can actually really open up space when you need to be close to the subject, because maybe there's a bulkhead that stops you backing away, but yep. you want to photograph more than is in one frame. And software like Lightroom now stitches pictures together really easily yep. as long as you overlap them by about 20 to 30%. Yep. So just, you know, shoot an area. I like to try and end up with a fairly normal shaped picture. I don't like a panorama that's just some, you know, like a piece of string. I yep. can't really enjoy it. I yep. want to, so I, I'll typically maybe shoot 
four or five verticals to end up making a, a fairly square or, you know, kind of the same size as Wet Pixel Live, 16 by 9. Yeah. Um, you know, type picture. I yeah. don't want to end up with a piece of string panorama, which no one can print or appreciate. Yeah. Um, but I think that's a really useful technique as well inside recs and also outside recs to get to get more of the wreck in from closer to the wreck. I, I would say that in general, underwater is a really good piece of advice that when you're shooting panoramas, when you're shooting, planning to stitch images together, turn the camera sideways, um, it makes a huge difference. Um, and, and I think it works so much better because, as you say, you end up with a with a usable image. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a. One thing I do notice, though, is that it, the pictures, it's quite hard to predict what a picture will look like panorama wise mm. in that. For example, I was saying about the Janice D stern. If you shoot the Janice D with a single fisheye shot, it's a very, very nice shape. It fills the frame. You know, we've both done it. Most underwater photographers who've dived there have mm. done that shot. Mm. If you go closer to the stern, and shoot it as a vertical panorama to end up with basically exactly the same photo, but shot show closer. Yeah. It does not look as nice because the shape it ends up making, even though you're closer and you end up with like a, a 200 megapixel image, the shape is not as pretty. So, you know, and, and it's the same of most things is some panoramas give you a great view inside the wreck, but photographically they don't work. And other ones that you weren't necessarily sure were gonna look great actually end up looking really nice and graphic. So you need to think a little bit about the scene you're shooting as a panorama and how it's going to end up looking as a final picture, mm. if you can envisage that, yeah. rather than just going, here's something big, I'm just going to panorama it. Yeah, yeah. Because it, you can often end up looking you know, quite, quite distorted or not anything like it does in life, because you're ultimately go, basically creating an even wider lens than a fisheye. So you get even more distortion. I think reverting to that to the to the to the idea of you know cutting edge technology. I think the Thistlegorn book. Um, have you got Have you got your copy? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, so I mean that's a really really good example. You know where you've got a combination of, of your imagery with um you know with photogrammetry. Not going to like these. Yeah, <laughs> didn't no no. Um, the, with you know it's a combination of, of of stunning visual images with photogrammetry with panoramas. You know there's a whole bunch of different disciplines there that are combined together to create. And I mean things like photogrammetry can actually produce some some phenomenally beautiful um, imagery. Um, yeah, I, absolutely. You know, and and you know, this is this is something again that that really lends itself because wrecks don't move around very much. Um, you know, it's really is a really um, great environment for for trying out these. I mean, the, new technologies maybe the wrong word, but these 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 technologies that are becoming more prevalent, so more more, yeah. more obvious. Yeah. Yeah, and and obviously a huge draw of wreck diving is also you know the the, the aspects of it that just attract normal divers, not just photographers in that, you know, you've got the history, you've got the tragedy, you, you've got the memorial aspects of, of a wreck experience that add, you know, another level to that whole, whole experience, both photographically and by creating beautiful images of those wrecks, you have the chance to share those stories with people, which I think Absolutely. is a, a real privilege we have not just as, uh, not, not, you know, beyond being divers, as being underwater photographers. Yep. We get to, you know, tell people about, you know, these tragic events and, and, and that sort of thing and, and make sure they're not forgotten. And bear witness to me, yeah, exactly, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Thank you, Alex. The Thistlegorn book, where can people get it from? Um, it's available online in places like Amazon. Um, but, yeah, this is just, just on one particular wreck, but it shows, you know, how fascinating wreck photography can be that you oh, can, yeah. you know, um, one wreck can, can yield, a, I think I've got more than 150 pictures in that book. Um, so it's, yeah. And I, well, I think it's a really good study of, of, of all the things we've been talking about, really, how fascinating they are for fundable photographers. So thank you very much, Alex. Um, and um, thanks again to Nauticamp for sponsoring this episode. Much appreciated. Um, and I'd like to thank you all for watching. Please feel free to add any comments to the comment section and to drop us a like if you enjoyed it. Thank you very much. I look forward to seeing you again soon.